My name is John Hurley. I serve the Unitarian Universalist Association as Director of Communications. And I'm honored to welcome you to Voices of the Veterans. In his 1966 Ware Lecture to our General Assembly, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King exhorted Unitarian Universalists to don't sleep through the revolution. He told the story of Rip Van Winkle, the classic Washington Irving story about Rip who slept for 20 years. But Dr. King noted that the most striking aspect of that story was not that Rip slept for 20 years, but that when he went up the mountain, the picture on the sign of the inn was King George III of England. And when he came down 20 years later, it was George Washington. Rip had slept through the revolution. I suggest to you that our seven presenters here this afternoon did not sleep through the revolution. Mark Morrison Reed, in his moving keynote this morning, reminded us that the grounding of our work is in the lived experience of authentic relationships. Our seven presenters today are going to talk to you about their role in the movement and the authentic relationships that motivated them. Our speakers are in order Susan Butler, the Reverend Clark Olson, the Reverend Jim Hobart, Robert Williams, Patricia Jefferson, Hollis Houston, and the Reverend Liz McMaster. They'll each give a brief presentation, following which, following all seven of them, there will be time for some questions. And I ask that those of you who would like to ask questions come to the microphone, and please make your questions short and a question. <laughs> Thank you. Our first speaker is Susan Butler. Good afternoon. Everybody hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Paul Murray of Siena College for lobbying my behalf and the um, Unitarian Universalists, especially Janice, for including me in this wonderful conference. I've been so, so impressed by your warmth and your uh, acceptance of, of everyone. On March 7th of 1965, my sister and I were watching Judgment at Nuremberg. I was glad to hear that referred to this morning. When it was interrupted by a news bulletin depicting the atrocities that were occurring in Selma. In the blink of an eye, we had moved from the terrible situation with the Jews in World War II under the Third Reich to a very, very frighteningly similar, similar situation in our own South. It was a stunning parallel. During the week that followed, Dr. King made an appeal to the uh, churches and churchmen to come down to uh, Selma, I almost said Mississippi. Um, during the week, I personally received a call from uh, Al Gordon, who was a fellow New York City public school teacher and had been a freedom writer. I had worked in uh, Mississippi the summer before during the Freedom Summer, so I was, you know, familiar with what was going on in the South. And Al had called to see if I would have go with him to Selma. That was instantly a yes. Um, I remember that, that Saturday, it must have been the 13th, we went to a, my sister and I actually took our parents to an Odetta concert at Town Hall in New York City. 
And it, it was a very tense situation on the one hand because I had decided not to tell my parents about going to Selma after having seen their reaction to my being in Mississippi. So at the end, everything was fine until the end of the concert when Odetta, as an encore, sang Ain't No Grave Gonna Hold This Body Down and dedicated it to Jimmy Lee Jackson and James Reed, who had died just the day of the birthday of Jimmy. Then I got very nervous, not about coming to Selma, but about my parents somehow being intuitive about this whole situation. <laughs> Uh, on March 14th, Al and I flew to Montgomery and were given housing with an absolutely wonderful woman and her family, now Mrs. Howard, uh, on Eugene Street in Selma. Now Mrs. Howard was the soul of endurance. She was a lady who worked very, very hard. She was up at 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning and she worked in a cigar factory all day long and never got home until late at night. Yet she was a lady who provided not only for her children, but she provided so beautifully for Al and I, and as though it was perfectly normal to be uh, functioning fully on about four hours sleep at night. It was amazing. During the week, a lot of different things happened during the week. Um, on Monday, there was an uh, aborted march. It was a spontaneous march that James Foreman had called um, with students from the university there that was blocked in and stopped by the uh, local police. And some of the students were very badly beaten. Two days later, Dr. King called a rally in uh, in Montgomery. Al and I, and here's another connection, um, we got a ride down to, to uh, Montgomery with uh, Unitarian ministers. And that was really the first time I had had anything to do with that particular religion. Uh, when we got to Montgomery, there was a rally in the black area just many people speaking and getting people riled up. And we marched down to the courthouse where Dr. King and James Foreman were uh, meeting with uh, Sheriff Butler uh, to try and iron out some new rules regarding uh, assemblage. The heavens opened in the afternoon and it had started out at 72 degrees and it poured and, the, and actually hailed, and the temperature dropped about 30 degrees. Um, while this was happening, finally about five o'clock, Dr. King and James Foreman came in, and they told us that, uh, that we should go home, but they were still negotiating. And in the midst of all this, uh, Andrew Young came out, and he came out to tell them that Judge Johnson had just ruled that we could have the march, that it was our constitutional right to have the march. So in spite of being drenched, we were thrilled. Now I'm getting my one minute sign, so I'm gonna close off uh, just by saying one or two words about the children in, uh, in Selma. They were everywhere and they were wonderful. A little girl skipping around, a couple little girls coming up to us and giving, asking us for our autographs, which in turn I asked them for theirs, because I thought they were far more important than, than I was. Um, after that, uh, there was an incident on the street where an older man, an older white man, got down on one knee with his three-year-old when Al and I were walking back. And he pointed at us and told that little boy that he wanted him to be sure that he would recognize white niggers. Interesting, just the difference between the two experiences. But later on, we also met a couple of older um, college students who told us that, uh, who asked us, they wanted to know why we were here. 
and I rethought that little boy who I wouldn't have given a prayer a chance to um, when I talked to these kids because they knew that there was something that they didn't understand. Thank you. Uh, I'm Clark Olson, now living in Asheville, North Carolina. You know some of, a little bit of my story anyway from Mark Morrison Green's talk this morning. Wonderful talk. Um, just, I'll try to say very briefly that um, going to Selma was a decision which, as he described, at first I thought, I don't have the money, and then, lo and behold, I did have the money. Cut off my excuses, and uh, I decided to go. I just decided to go. Uh, I had no idea that been none of the South before, but I assumed it was uh, a thousand or eight hundred clergy, sheriff clerks, deputies were not going to, well, the state troopers were not going to attack, and that I'd be safe. That was the assumptions I made. <clears throat> I went to, to Selma, and you know the story of what happened. Um, let me say just briefly about that, that it was very, very scary. Uh, it was not quite as portrayed in the uh, film. Uh, first of all, or in the film, uh, Jim Breen was accompanied by one person, <clears throat> but there were two of us. Orloff Miller, or you, you're sitting here someplace, the guy saw you come in over here. Orloff and I were both there at the time. and. Contrary to the film, Jim Reed was not hit multiple times by a club. He was hit just one time on the head as he was walking beside us. But that one club fell to him and led him to soon be incoherent, babbling. And Orloff and I managed to get him around the corner to the Boynton Insurance Agency and from there to an ambulance. The ambulance had a flat tire. A car full of whites pulled up behind us. We didn't know we were on a country road. The radio telephone and the ambulance didn't work. And um, I remember thinking, oh my God, this is all a uh, conspiracy, possibly. And I'm going to be in a ditch tonight, uh, along with Schwarmer, Cheney, and Goodman, who had been found in a ditch just three or four months before. I was really afraid. Orloff. I think wasn't so afraid because he kept taking notes on the whole thing. <laughs> uh, we haven't compared degrees of fairness, but uh, I'm sure that would be to all off on that. Um, in addition, I had a, a history, childhood history, of rheumatic fever when I was tw twice when I was 12 and 16 years old. So my heart valves didn't work very well; they were badly scarred. And I now have artificial valves and operate on a battery, which has been the case for the last 20 years or so. Uh, but at that time, that heart. I'm like uh, Mark. He can't talk without crying either. <laughs> um, no, I wish I were like Martin. Um, anyway, uh, it was an important part of me growing up. My parents were told by doctors, they didn't tell me, but my parents were told by doctors when I was 16 years old that I probably wouldn't live to be 21. I'm now 81. So, uh, <laughs> For the first 20 years, virtually, I, I don't remember speaking to any groups. Uh, I spoke to my congregation when I returned from Selma in Berkeley, but I don't remember speaking to any other groups for at least 20 years. It was when Eyes on the Prize came out, and then Black History Month, and then Martin Luther King's birthday. Then I began to get invitations to speak. And since then, I've felt privileged I felt it a gift. The people wanted to hear. 
I felt it a gift that I was able to tell the story. I felt it a gift that I was not on that side of the sidewalk, I was on that side. I was a gift that I was alive and I was healthy. And over the years, the meaning grew. As people asked me, what do you think was the meaning of all this? What did it do, etc.? Well, one of the things that came out of that is very strong for me was that it was the death of the white person, the white minister, that was the final tipping point for the passage of the Voting Rights Bill. I think even uh, the movie suggests that, but I believe that's quite true. Today's New York Times has, the on the website, has an interview with me, and you may see that the headline is Calls to Selma. At the time, I, I learned some years ago that research at the Johnson Library showed that President Johnson had made, in reference to Jimmy Lee Jackson's death, Johnson had made not one phone call, zero, but in reference to Jim Reeb's death, there were, I had been told, I thought, 57, but the New York Times in the last two days fact-checked it and found it was, it was about 50 calls that had been made. The difference between the two is just enormous. And for me to be able to stand up before blacks and whites and tell blacks and have blacks realize, yes, that, black, that whites were there, it wasn't, that all of that is, all of the civil rights stuff is not just Martin Luther King. It was a lot of people who did a lot of things, suffered a great deal, and among them, I, white people were there. And by the nature of the racism in our society, it was the death of a white minister that was the tipping point. I say that not out of pride, but out of political reality. I think that's true. Uh, I believe that's true. Um, so I'll leave it at that. That's my lesson from it. And I feel very privileged, very privileged. Just a half an hour ago, I had a call from Al Jazeera checking another fact. They're putting up something in two hours on the internet about this whole thing from an interview they had with me. So I've had opportunities galore in the last three months to speak about that. And I love it. It's been a gift to me, and I greatly appreciate it. Mark uh, spoke about the rela relational quality of, of the involvement in Selma. Um, and, and speaking to the relational quality, I, I would like to acknowledge that in addition to these people sitting up here, that as I look out into uh, the audience here, I, I see five or six or maybe more veterans who are not represented up here. And uh, I think we need to acknowledge all of them. Uh, I'm not going to start mentioning names because I probably didn't have to uh, miss someone. Um, I'm a Southern Unitarian Universalist. Grew up in New Orleans and Charleston, South Carolina, and Birmingham, Alabama. And um, there, there's a special quality about that, and it especially applied to Birmingham even more than the the other places that my father, who uh, served as a Unitarian Universalist minister when I was growing up. And in Birmingham, simply to choose to walk across the door and come into the church was a statement. And you didn't have to say anything. You didn't have to do anything else. That identified you as a person of, of a certain type. So that's the kind of Unitarianism that uh, I grew up with and that I carried with me as I went off into college and then to theological school. Uh, so the, the, it, was, it, was, it was just crystal clear to me that, that social justice work was an integral part of what the church was about. Um, 
So, I graduated theological school in, in 1964, and I started my first ministry in a little town in Upton, Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, that was the summer of 64. And uh, then, of course, we began to be aware of things beginning to develop in Selma uh, shortly after the first of the year. Um, and uh, my first actual direct connection to what was going on in Selma was I got a telephone call on Tuesday evening the 9th from Jack Mendelson, and he said, do you know any doctors in Birmingham we can trust that Jim Reeve has been injured and uh, he's going up to Birmingham? So I put them in touch with, with some doctors that I knew in Birmingham. Uh, I, I'm quite confident that he would have been well treated even without that, but it was nice to kind of have that re reassurance. At that point, my father was the um, associate regional director for the southeastern United States. So he was in Atlanta, and he had been going back and forth uh, from Atlanta to, to Selma, often to carry people there. So that happened on Tuesday night, and I immediately decided that it was time for me to go. But I knew I had some political work to do first, because I did not want to go without the support of my congregation, especially the leadership of my congregation. So it took me several days to build that support so that I could go off comfortably and not feel I was going to have a, a problem when I, <laughs> I returned to my church. So I, le I, I left for um, Alabama on the, um, the 14th, the next Sunday, and uh, got to, to Atlanta, and my father carried me over to Birmingham, and I was there, uh, and over to Selma, and I was there in time for Martin Luther King's address uh, for the memorial service for, for James Reed. Um, there's so many stories I could tell, but let, let me mention two things in particular. Uh, the two men that I want to identify that uh, were so important to what uh, happened to me when I was in Selma. The names may be familiar to some of them, some of you. James Orange, anybody ever heard of James Orange? Yep. Uh, and Albert Turner. And uh, I literally put my life into their hands as they carried me around to, through Selma and outside of Selma. Went to Marion, Alabama to talk with the white ministers there, um, which was quite an experience. And Albert Turner was my guide on that trip. Um, this, you know, I had been all clear in my head up to that point about social justice and how it worked. What, what I discovered in Selma was that, that how important it was for the people who, who were suffering the indignities and the injustice to be in charge. And I was able to put my life into their hands for what they wanted me to do, not for me to make the decision. So it moved from up here down deep into my guts. And uh, it's, thank you. It, 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 it has remained that way for me all, all the rest of my life as, as we move in this last 50 years from, from civil rights to black empowerment and and on up to uh, 2015. So that, that's that's the basic story. There, there's so many so many incidents that I could I could report, but the the big message again is is Mark's message about a relationship, and I built those relationships and uh, they, they've car they've carried me forward in in my life and, and in my ministry and in the social justice work I've been involved in. Some of you in the southern region, Unitarian Universalists, the Church of South, may remember me in my presentation of Misunderstanding God, the journey, journey of a black belt agnostic. 
I've had uh, some delightful experiences uh, traveling and sharing that story, but I just want to key in on the black belt part today briefly. It is, of course, the part of the country that I'm from here in Alabama, the black belt. Hometown is a little place called Uniontown, Alabama, right on the other side of Selma. I know most of the streets and roads throughout that area personally. Marion, Selma, Hainville down in Lowndes County, Montgomery. I'm very much acquainted with uh, those places. And what I saw happening in Selma, of course, what had preceded that in Montgomery and Birmingham, caused me to think very differently about the general perception that we black folk had of white folk. We learned that uh, we definitely couldn't put all white folk in the same barrel. And this goes back to boyhood, quite frankly. The experiences that I had growing up as a boy covered the range of experiences when you grow up in an oppressed group. But I hesitated throughout boyhood to share many of those experiences with others because it contradicted the general perception that most of our people had. What I'm saying very directly is that I discovered that there were a lot of people of European ancestry who were hoping, praying, waiting, and working along beside us to change what was happening in the South. My experience with respect to the Selma Montgomery March was quite frankly at the end of it. I was uh, in a manpower development training program. It was a federal program that started under the MDTA Act. And I was one of two African Americans involved in that. And they wouldn't let us have the integrated program at John Patterson Technical School in Montgomery, so they arranged for it to be in a building on the western side of Montgomery, Fairview Avenue. And those of you who marched in from Selma know that West Fairview was the turning point where you get off Highway 80 and come on up into Montgomery to say to you, Cleveland Avenue, which is now Rosa Parks Avenue and on downtown. The particular day the march had arrived in Montgomery, I had to be in school. There were 25 men in this program. There were two of us African Americans. The one, the other one, didn't come to school that day, and he didn't go enjoy the march either. He was, uh, in my opinion, just scared. So for whatever reason, I was there with the other 23 men, and they were of various ages from somewhere around age 21 up to about age 75. These were men who basically were involved in many of the electronic uh, training, development, and engineering projects from World War II, some of them Korean War, and the younger men like myself. I don't know who it was that was one of the advanced scouts with the march from Selma, but at that time, they had to check out buildings as they were coming in to see if there were people who were in hiding with rifles and guns to shoot at the marches. And to this day, I don't know who the brother was. He came in with his overalls on and he looked and he was startled. He drew back and said, what's going on here? And he came directly over to me, and I can sense there was a little fear there. He said, uh, brother, is everything all right? I looked around and said, uh, yeah, this is uh, a school, and we're studying electronics here. And he said, uh, I feel so much better. All right, carry on. <laughs> what he did know 
And this is something that uh, I've shared only once or twice. There was one elderly gentleman that had brought a gun to school with him that day. And I saw him showing it to another elderly white gentleman that was with him on the workbench up where he was. There were two younger white men that worked at my workstation along with me, and they were between the age of 21 and 25, I believe. They knew that, and I won't call this gentleman's name because he didn't shoot anybody that day, but they moved over towards me and said, Robert, uh, we're not gonna let anything happen here today. So you just be cool. And they kind of moved in close to me and they looked down at that other hand and there, the look in the eyes were, nothing is gonna happen here today. He put his gun away and went into another part of the uh, classroom. I'll never forget that. The two guys who said, we're not going to have any problems here today. I discovered that to be a common theme throughout the 60s and the 70s. And this is where I got to meet Dr. John McKee, who was the first Unitarian that I met. He was the director of the prison project. Therefore, my work took me on into the prisons, and that is quite a story to tell. The prison behavior modification unit at Draper Prison became a model for the country in preparations to the next phase of the movement, the criminal justice phase. I'd like to talk about the criminal justice phase perhaps in little private sessions at this workshop if I have time. Thank you for uh, all coming here. Thank you, Unitarians. I became one in 2004, and I'm glad I found you.
decided to be a part of the integration of Pensacola High School. If you know anything about the South, if the school is named after the city, it is the place to be. First, we consented to do it, and I had to get permission from my parents, and they gave us a similar to an SAT test in the school on a Saturday for eight hours to see if we were bright enough. I, to this day, don't know whether I passed or failed because they broke it down demographically into somebody's mother being a maid, somebody's father being a principal, my father was a union member truck driver. There were only eight of us who supposedly were accepted, so here we go at the age 15 to this all-white school. When I say all-white, I mean 708 students, there were eight blacks and 700 whites. So being who I am, we organized ourselves a little area where we met every morning after the police would leave to do a head count. We did it in the morning, we did it in the afternoon. We transitioned into the white little blouses and plaid skirts so we could show our camaraderie because once we got inside the corridors of the school, we were like infantry. Everybody went to the left, everybody went to the right, and those people who might sneak a smile at you, people being white people, uh, when they were that file and rank, they couldn't do that if they did that somewhere else. So you kept getting these mixed messages of what's okay, what's not okay. Well, lo and behold, when I left Pensacola High School with my rebel flag ring, Ruby, $19 that my daddy raised particular hell about having to pay for it. My mom said, you let her go, you encouraged her to stay, so you're going to buy that ring. Uh, I later gave it away. I couldn't wait to get to Shaw University, an all-black little Baptist college in Raleigh, North Carolina, to begin to be me. And the me that came was the face of integration that only wanted access, it didn't want anything else, hence the Kente for my royalty and the blonde for my resistance. Okay, that's what I'm about. I'm gonna own me, what I'm gonna love, and I'm gonna be a human being at any cost, every day, any day, all day. I had the privilege of being at, while being at Shaw, of being selected to become a VISTA Shaw volunteer, was sent to the nation's capital, and that's when I first felt at home because there were black mannequins in the windows downtown go downtown and shop with somebody that looked like me. We were placed in the homes of private citizens who had children or whatever and we were there for two weeks and we lived their life and then we were sent out into the community to an agency and assigned. And again, my journey has just been in stages. Uh, went back to Shaw, I was able to have an audience with Dick Gregory who spoke to our group I was uh, chosen as the bride for the first African wedding ceremony. I was the mock bride. Of course, my uh, sister's uh, friend came running across campus to tell her she showed up for my wedding because she wasn't sure whether it was a wedding or whether it was a wedding, you know, marriage or wedding. So there have been a lot of interesting experiences in my life because I just refuse to lose who I am and I want to embrace all that I am as much as I can. Probably the revolutionary point for me was at Watts Festival in Los Angeles while visiting my sister one summer. And that's when I said, it's on, it's on, it's on. But I've since been a federal official. I've since uh, worked with community organizations. I uh, pretty much retired my spirit for a minute after working in HIV AIDS, counseling and testing. I'm in a life restoration mode at this point. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being a part of that. And I found home again, because when I go back to Gainesville, Florida, I promise you I will be a voice in the Unitarian Universalist Association. Thank you so much. Hollis Houston, I'm a chaplain in New York City.
6.30 this morning, I woke up and opened the program for this meeting and uh, checked the time and the place, and then the title of this panel just went right through me. And I said, uh, well, my wife uh, says that since then I've looked like a deer in the headlights, and I, I feel like a deer in the headlights because I am not worthy to be called a veteran of the movement. There are people on this table who are right there, right there at a sacred world-changing moments, and there are people out there hearing us of whom the same thing can be said, and I am not one of them. I, I, I was asked to be here because I came to a <coughs> campus a few years after these events that had been a state <coughs> point for activism in the movement. I had a certain experience. I'll try to tell you about it briefly. I was certainly raised to the struggle. My father was an extremely learned radical Protestant minister who, whose last seven years of ministry were as an associate pastor in an African Methodist Episcopal Church in the north end of Hartford. I still don't quite know how he did it. <laughs> um, so he was very glad that after my MA degree in 1970, I went to Tougaloo College, north of Jackson, Mississippi, to be an instructor of drama and speech. Now, this was five decades ago. It was the very last days when anybody could take an MA degree and go teach at a college. You know what I mean. Uh, well, in any case, uh, the market was such that I was the guy they picked, and this was the job I got. I hadn't expected it. I picked up everything and moved to Mississippi. I did not do well. My first semester was a disaster. And in the second semester, I picked up the pieces and I was learning some things, but not fast enough, nor in some respects the right things, to save my job. And at the end of that all, I was hightailing it back to another degree and to graduate school. I was, um, here's the thing that I think may be important, may be interesting. My task, which I began, was uh, not described in the contract. It was for me to begin to figure out on what terms justice could be articulated in art between me and people who had been for centuries oppressed and denied dignity and who would now be looking for it in new terms, in a new kind of struggle. I had the privilege and the stressful experience of being taken behind the veil. If you know Du Bois's book, I find that a, I didn't know about the veil while I was being taken behind it. I, I learned later what that was that had happened. And I still uh, find that image to be very poignant and descriptive behind the veil to see things that ordinarily people like me don't get to see, didn't particularly then get to see, things that maybe I wasn't supposed to see, things I certainly wasn't supposed to take back to my white friends and tell them about. Um, sometimes it was difficult to articulate it to my black friends. It was a very lonely learning for 40 years, my trying to make sense of that time. Here's, here's the thing that, uh, first of all, I'll just say I'm, I was, of course, totally inexperienced as a teacher, and I was not well formed as an adult human being at the time. There was lots of, lots of weakness on my part. And I wish, uh, sometimes I wish that I could have uh, confronted this challenge at a more mature time in my life, and I could have made, made more of it uh, before I had to leave it. But it has been with me forever. And um, I'm going to try to explain to you what, what was really earth-shaking for me, and I do not mean necessarily in a pleasant way. Um, the hardest thing for me to come to grips with, as I watched performers, as I tried to get performances staged, and sometimes succeeded at the beginning did not, as I watched 
audiences of various kinds of presentations is that sometimes I would see black performers say things in a way or behave in a certain way that I had been taught was despicable. No one could ever represent a black person that way. And I would say to myself, oh my god, this room is not going to accept this at all. And I would wait and they would not only accept it, they would break into tears. They would identify. And that took the floor out from underneath me. I said, why am I here? What am That's a very good question. It maybe should have been a different person who was here. But how to understand that and articulate it? I think it has to do with the veil. I think it has to do with the double consciousness that when people have been oppressed for so long, they must present what can be called a mask to the power structure, reserving their presentation, their authentic self for each other and for themselves. And then a complicated thing has happened. The mask becomes written on from underneath, and the mask becomes double, and the mask becomes sometimes a proud achievement, a way of surviving the unsurvivable, a proud thing that people do. Now, there are aspects of culture that keep coming up and keep being argued over. Um, I think the one I'm going to choose is language. Mark Twain has gotten in trouble when he tried to describe the language of the only human being that Huck Finn could trust when he tried to represent that person's language. And he didn't try to represent it as a white person's language. He tried to represent it as something else. And he's gotten in trouble for that. Who is he to say that? It's not accurate. It's demeaning. It's, well, that, that's an argument that goes on. Scott Joplin wrote an opera called Tremonitia. And in that opera, in that opera by a great black musical artist, some of the characters speak what could be called a dialect. And sometimes when that opera has been staged, as at the Houston Grand Opera in 1975, the language was cleaned up. And I say to myself, what authority would a person like me have to clean up the language of a great black artist to make it more like mine, maybe so that I will feel better? What is that? And when that opera was at the uh, Opera Theater of St. Louis a couple of decades later, they consulted with a black studies professor at Washington University, and he said, no, no, no. First of all, this is Joplin's presentation of his own community. And second, it's integral to the plot. Some characters have this language and some do not. And so they restored and played it authentically. So let's speak just about the language. I'm going to conclude a point about language. I've been back to Tuvalu twice. The first time was about 40 years after I taught there. Um, I just wandered through. I saw the places I'd worked, and I walked outside the little parking lot outside, and when I came out to that parking lot, there was a red convertible, and a gentleman came and sat down in that car, and he looked at me, and he said, hello, sir. And I said, hi. And he said, are you here for the conference? And I said, what conference? He said, the Gullah Language Conference. <laughs> and we got to talk, and he put in my hand a red bound volume of the New Testament in Gullah. And I, I looked at that book, and I paged through it, and I pulled out the Beatitudes, and I started to read them. And I, I know I read them wrong, and I know it's not my language, but what I felt I held in my hand was an approved text, proofed by scholars, but particularly endorsed by that group of my fellow Americans who say, this is our language, which we are proud of. And I felt that I had been in touch with something authentic, and I would have to say that in my still rambling behind the veil, a place where I am in no way qualified to be, but I was pulled in there a long time ago, I have to keep looking for moments like that. That's it. Thank you. You all are so attentive. I've been watching you, and you just blew. This is wonderful. I also don't feel that I belong here. I, I thought that, that I probably didn't belong here, but I think I do because I uh, know so many women who wanted to go to Selma, but had to stay home with the children. And we are regional. Um, my husband and my three children, ages six months to seven years, moved to Atlanta 
from New Jersey in 1961, and I saw a world that I've never seen before. Uh, segregation was still riding high. Um, I lived in a neighborhood where segregation was riding high. And um, I found both Unitarian Universalism and the Civil Rights Movement at the same time and started to find out who I really was. Uh, Jean Pickett was my minister of uh, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Atlanta, UUCA, grew from 120 members downtown of the United Liberal Church to a church, uh, to a church that we built out in a, not the best place in town, but we were redlined every place we tried to find a place for a home. We grew to 1,200 members. Jean was my mentor. Um, and my friend, and uh, through him, I started in 62 or three or four, in 64, with a down, a downtown Girl Scout troop. Uh, my four-year-old daughter had to go with me because I didn't have any other place for her. And uh, we took the kids out in the country where they'd never been. They were sure there were snakes in the wood pile. They may have been. Uh, they were scared to death of the dark because they lived in the city where it really gets dark. Uh, by 1965, I had been volunteering for the Southern, Southern Christian Leadership uh, Conference, and, and uh, the first time I went down to Sweet Auburn, um, I was scared because it was a neighborhood that I didn't know. But I knew I needed to be um, with people that thought the same way I did. Um, so then um, we got the call for Selma, and I said to my husband, well, I'm going. And he said, well, you're not. <laughs> you have children to take care of. And uh, although I didn't think it at the time, I'm pretty sure that it was because he was scared to death and he didn't know how. Um, <laughs> so I picked up all the blankets in the, fan in the house, except a few on our beds and took them to Jean to take to Selma. Uh, I became more involved with people in the church. I knew some of the best black people and some of the white, best white people I'll ever know in my life during um, those times. Uh, and, but I guess the thing that I remember the most is that the day after Dr. King died, I got a call from a good friend at the church to ask if I would go to the airport and pick up Rabbi Heschel and his wife and his, and his child and take them to Dr. King's house. I'd done voter registration and I knew where Dr. King and Coretta and the children lived. And so I took the good rabbi and um, his wife and his child. and. Um, then did what I could. I went out and got cigarettes and camera film for whoever needed it. And about 10.30 before, just as people were starting to head for Ebenezer, somebody finally, finally, at the last minute, decided that somebody needed to stay at the house because, you know, that's a good time for me and me uh, when everybody's at the funeral. And so I was asked to stay at Dr. King's house to watch his funeral on his television set. That was um, pretty amazing. Um, and then I went and picked up my family and we walked across town to Morehouse for, uh, uh, for the rest of the day's program. For about six months after Dr. King died, um, a bunch of us uh, went down to the King house and sorted mail. Um, they, uh, we'd go about two or three times a week, and uh, Mrs. King, Coretta, would come down and speak to us and thank us for what we were doing. We handled over a million pieces of mail from all over the world that they would bring in from the post office, and they, you know, those great big postal bags, um, just sorting them as to country, state, city, whatever. It was one of the uh, highest privileges of my life. And I owe it to just pure luck that 
brought me to Atlanta when it did, when, when we moved there, to Gene Pickett and the rest of the UUCA friends that, uh, that I've kept all this time. I'm, I'm grateful to all of you who came here, and I'm grateful to those of you on the planning committee who worked so hard for so long to put this together. So thank you. what's good in the world, that we with differences are sitting together and we're communicating and we're loving and we're open and we're kind and I just feel like this is human royalty and may it be contagious in the world. Are there questions for any of our panels? Oh, would you go to the microphone please? Thank you. Hi, I guess I just would like to direct this to you, uh, Revelyn Olson. Um, given what you witnessed and what you experienced there, and maybe for the rest of you too, I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts and feelings on um, what the Supreme Court did to the Civil Rights Act two years ago. Well, I'm appall I was appalled by it. Um, I guess I don't need to go into a lot of details, but I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable comfortable in that there are rising in the country and voices and gatherings that are going to do something about that. Uh, the most, the most exciting experience I've had in that regard is being among 80,000 people in Raleigh some months ago when William Barber, the Reverend Barber spoke. He speaks tomorrow morning, I think, or maybe with us. Uh, I shall be there. He is a very dynamic person. And if there's anything that could change Alabama, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, North Carolina, that's where I'm from, if there's anything that could change it, he's among them. And he's got a lot of followers, so I'm pleased that he's got a lot of followers. And, and his fellow workers, I won't say followers, fellow workers, uh, that's happening. And I'm confident that there's enough beginning to happen at least around the country as a reaction to all that. It may take a while. It took a long time, it took 100 years to get the blacks registered to vote in the South. It not, hopefully will not take 100 years. To, it, it, it may, more than anything else, simply take the demographic shifts which are already underway in our culture. Tom Cherry from River Road Unitarian Universalist in Bethesda, Maryland. I've already started to address it, but I've been concerned about the latent racism that's really risen up with the election of Barack Obama. And how do you see that we can move into the future and do something to address that and overcome it? Would you like to address that to a specific panel? No, I think. All of them have ideas about that. Would someone like to uh, heal that? <laughs> I, I am a take action person. Patricia, you need a microphone. Okay, I'm sorry. I am a take action person. I think that every thought we have is the beginning of something that can make a difference. Uh, I started a group on Facebook. And I'm determined that that social media vehicle, it has so much power that we've just not tapped and we've not really maximized the impact it can have on our society. But the page that I started is called For the Children. And I'm back to the whole village concept from the motherland to neighborhoods that you know, when something happens, when you learn something, you share it and teach the children. So I have to stop myself from just constantly trying to re-educate and 
have us rethink who we are as human beings, regardless of color, and that we all bleed and that we all blend. And I'm trying to approach that from two different, two different angles. One is over here we have the group that needs to understand that they are kings and queens, that they're, they're stages in their struggle, and that they've come beyond some stages in this time to embrace their worthiness and their wealth. Over here I'm saying to this other group that's involved or the, the participants, um, we're all one, we think, we can speak, we can agree to disagree. Let's forgive, let's love more consciously. Thank you, Patricia. Jim. Yeah, um, I think in America, the, the history of, of racism has been when it's been dealt with in one way, like the end of slavery, it morphs into something else. So, you know, it, it's a continuing issue and a problem in, in, in this society. I, I think that blatant racism has to be met with blatant justice. Um, unapologetically blatant justice. And that requires community and it requires institutionalization. And uh, that, that's the answer that I would have to uh, expressions of blatant racism. Thank you, Jim. Robert, I have a brief comment. Uh, that's a very good question, and it's one that's been discussed quite a bit since Barack Obama's been president. Um, one thing that I've had some difficulty with my grandsons, they're now 21 twins. We raised them from when they were three months old, so we've gotten to know each other very intimately. And We've had some difficult discussions about race, uh, primarily because they occur when you're not ready to talk about stuff like that. <laughs> you know? And it generally comes up like uh, Barack Obama's first black president, et cetera, et cetera. And for some reason, I have to always start an argument by saying, listen, son, Barack Obama had a black father and a white mother. How come you always want to ignore the fact that his mother is white? He is not a black or a white man. Black Barack Obama is president of the United States of America. Black and white. Mexican, Chinese. And he doesn't think of himself as just a black man. Said, look at the pictures of his mom and his grandparents, etc., and the one you see of his father. Barack Obama is us. And in order to punctuate that, I sent my DNA sample off so that I could find some of my father's relatives, my dad, who I don't know. And this is what I'm going to conclude with. I have something like 975 relatives in 23andMe, Ancestry.com. Half of them put that picture there. And I want you to know something. Three-fourths of those relatives in 23andMe DNA database, Robert Williams, are Europeans. They are white. And we know how that happened. So I have no problem with discussing race ever again. It does not matter to me again. Dick Hilbert, Rochester, New York. I had one couple with Marx book, <clears throat> Selma Awakening. I discussed it with him. I think he agrees with me on it. And that is, why do we have to wait for a dramatic and horrific event like Selma to be awakened? What do we do for the long, hard slog of justice making when there aren't Selmas to motivate us, to stir us up? And I worry about that in our own movement, that we seem only to react to the dramatic. We don't have the persistence of discipline to carry on that kind of struggle without the Selma's happening. For anybody who'd like to tackle. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to go back to a point that Mark made reference to, as a matter of fact. Uh, that is, it has, one of the things that's come to me in the last years, if what I've done about speaking about Selma and so on, and I know so many of the, as a result of 
my situation. I've come to know many of the civil rights people. But one thing I know that I had not done, and I realized this in the last, let's say, 10 or 15 years, is that I haven't reached out into the community and simply gotten to know more people on a one-to-one -one basis. And I changed that four or five years ago when my wife and I ceased to belong to the YMCA in town and are now members and have been for four or five years with the YWCA, which is uh, mostly, mostly women, but it's also blacks, mostly blacks. And I have among many individual friendships that reaching out on a social basis, on a daily basis, on a friendly basis, on a person-to-person -person basis. I've really enjoyed that, and I've never had that experience in my life before, of reaching out in that way. And I think that's one piece of the solution. All of us taking every every opportunity we have to meet people and become friends with people and to know a person as a person rather than a race. Um, by the way, I'll also mention uh, Lewis Gates' program, the tracing of DNAs. And I love the idea that there's no such thing as race. Uh, there's no such thing as race. The white clergy in Birmingham? Marion. Oh, the white clergy in Marion. Yeah, okay. Um, this, this was a group of, of the, the group that went over there was a group of, of, of northern white clergy to go meet with their southern clergy colleagues in, in the city. I got assigned to the Methodist Church. And uh, so, Albert Turner that I mentioned earlier saw that I got there and we went in and sat down with this minister. Now this was, this was a minister who had, had been educated, I forget whether it was at Vanderbilt or whether it was in um, Atlanta, at um, Canberra. But, but you know, so he, this, this man was not some sort of uneducated Southern, Southern racist. He was in a terrible, terrible situation. Um, there had been a rumor started in town that one of the local restaurant owners had, had served black people in the white part of the restaurant, which had not happened. But the rumor got started, and so whites started boycotting his restaurant. And so this minister took his wife and his children and went to the restaurant to support this man. And just for that simple act, he, you know, he was suddenly marked as a troublemaker. Uh, it was really hard for those uh, white clergy in, in, a, in a little small town like that to take very much of a, a progressive position, even though their education in, in ministry had prepared them for that. It was an awful place to have to be. And I don't know about what, what, what transpired with the others, because that, that was who I wanted to see. Thanks, Jim. I'm uh, Bruce Pollock Johnson from Philadelphia. I wanted to follow up on uh, Dick Gilbert's question comments. Uh, I, I don't know the details. I'm sure there are people in the room here who do better. But and Selma didn't just happen. The idea is you look for the places in the system where there are injustices look to see where you can find a place that will expose the, the brutality that has to come out to enforce whatever that structure is, and that's when something happens. You don't just wait till it happens. You need to orchestrate carefully, strategically. How do you find those most critical structures and expose them? And I think that's, we've got minds um, here that are tuned into that, and that's what we should be spending some of our time doing, is thinking about what are the structures now that are causing Ferguson and other things? Where can we have the leverage? It's harder to see. It was a lot more visible when you had a segregated South. That's our challenge, and I hope we can all brainstorm together to think about what those strategies and what those points are. Thank you. Jim, I, 
can I say can I say something? I think uh, Bruce makes me think too that um, there are an awful lot of issues out today. Maybe there always have been, and it just seems that we hear about them because of electronics. And I know I was in um, one of our churches talking about uh, legislative action uh, some uh, some time ago. And as I left to go to coffee hour, uh, one of the women said, "Oh, so many issues." And I said, then just pick one and work like your life depended on. Thank you, Liz. I think this needs to be our last question. Hi, I'm Bart Cross, Director of the Youth and Young Adult Ministries at the UA. And I've noticed that there's a lot of collective justice meaning life experience right up here on the stage. And back in the 60s, most of y'all were the age that our millennials or post-millennials are today who are currently engaging in activism. And this is a question for each one of you. In one sentence, what wisdom would you share with our youth today? One sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and and don't, don't pile up the dependent clauses either. <laughs> That's really very hard. Uh, That's it. I, <laughs> um, I think that I would say, hold on and keep your eyes open, and your time will come. Do something. Step up. You never know what may happen. Look what happened to me. Um, do something. That's it. Connect to institutions that are working for justice. Get ready to work with people you've never worked with before because this planet is changing. Be accountable to what you believe. To quote my friend Gordon Gibson, show up, shut up, listen, make yourself useful, and let go of the results because your life, the arc of history is longer than your life. Be present. Susan, Clark, Jim, Robert, Patricia, Hollis, Liz, thank you.